and welcome to the block it is another day another dollar and this episode we're going to talk about chain interoperability between evm and non-evm when i say evm it's ethereum virtual machines and this is the thing because i think it was vitalik buterin who wrote interoperability within, I think, 2016 between different chains. And we do have a special guest who's going to talk about that today on this episode. So stick around because you will be in for a treat and a word from our sponsors. This blockchain continuing education program is brought to you by our major sponsors. HTML coin, utility coin beyond the hype. Altash University, your online school in the fourth industrial revolution. Libra Codes, take control on your NFT creation. And Credence Hub, verified credentials, anytime, anywhere. We also would like to thank our partners. Yep, we would like to thank our partners. Welcome to the block. And if this is your first time here and you find value in what we do, don't forget to like and share, comment, and subscribe to our channel. And we would really appreciate it. And without further ado, again, I would like to welcome and introduce the host of the blog. She's no other than Dr. Tammy Francis. Hello, Doc Vince. How is it going? It's doing great. And today, like I mentioned, EVM. How are you, Dr. Tammy? I'm great. I'm great. It's been one of those days. I've been just, you know, it's the beginning of the semester. So I'm always, you know, juggling some things and just trying mm. to get used to a new schedule, a new semester. So, you know, I'm happy to be here. This is a nice change of pace today from grading and, you know, doing that sort of thing. So I'm excited. <laughs> and it's a new pace for me because I literally don't have any background of what EVM is. And it would, be you know what, let's talk about it. Like mm -hmm. that's me. Like this is an area, you know, I've heard the in letters, thrown around, but nobody mm -hmm. really says what it stands for, right? right? They just throw them around. And I'm not an Ethereum person. Oops, did I say that out loud? And so <laughs> therefore, I, and I'm, I'm very, I'm a novice in that particular space. You know, I, I started with the blockchain, Bitcoin, that thing. So I haven't, I'm not as familiar with um, Ethereum. So I, you know, so, and, and like that may not even be what it stands for. The E may not be. <laughs> Like this is, so this is definitely something. So even by the letters being on the screen, I'm like, we need to start with a basic definition. Let's start there. What is it? And um, and talking about it. So I'm really excited about today's topic, Doug Fence, because, you know, I'm, I'm learning today. This yes. is an area that I, you know, I, like I say, I've seen it thrown around and I like to learn more, but, you know, because I play in other spaces, mm -hmm. this this provides an opportunity for me to pause and learn. So do, do, do I hear a Bitcoin maximalist here? <laughs> no, it's just, we'll, we'll talk about that on another episode because yeah, I can but, get but, into but that the thing is, my philosophy around that, but we won't get into that today because that's no, a no. whole other <laughs> episode no, and I know. <laughs> and that's the reason so why we do we have a subject matter expert, Dr. Tammy. Who's but that's talk? something we should talk about in the future mm -hmm. because I do have a philosophy around when people are entering the space and very new and what you introduce them to first. Not saying that's the only thing that they, you know, pay attention to and, and learn, but there is a process. I'm an educator. So I think of, you know, the progression and what that should look like. But we'll talk about that. So yeah. I have a whole philosophy on that and <laughs> we can talk about that. We can, so we can talk I have, about that. But I will yeah, say ahead. that I've gotten more into the Ethereum space because of the NFTs, right? And so, and looking at that. So, you know, and I think that's 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 part your fault because I think you gave me one of my first NFTs. <laughs> I did. And that's what we're going to do to our guests. We're going to give them some Ooh, nice. NFTs. And I know our guest is waiting right now at the back and you could introduce him our subject matter expert, and I'll give the floor to you, Dr. Tammy. Go ahead, please. 
Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Make sure that you say hello to us. Make sure that you comment and tell us who you are, where you're joining us from, where in the world are you joining us from? Because you may be watching this morning, in the afternoon, or at nighttime. It just depends on where you are in the world at the time of this show. And so, um, and I know it's morning here because that's typically when we do our live show, but it may be another time in the world where you are. So make sure you say hello to us and definitely follow us. You know, this, the block is about introducing you to subject matter experts and making sure that you're exposed to those who have the knowledge in the, on the different topics that we highlight on this show. Um, Doc Vince and I, we don't know everything about everything. And I don't think anybody in this space does because it's so new. However, that's a whole other philosophical difference that I have for some people. But I do like to share credible, reliable, and sources that we have um, come across and have engaged with at some level with you. Um, that way you can start your journey as you start researching. You know, I, I'm a researcher and I always think about credible sources and references and how you can do that. You know, and when people say do your own research, you could land anywhere if they don't give you a starting point. And so the block is about giving you that starting point and highlighting the blockchain profession and the different avenues and career paths that you can enter and um, occupy in this space. And I'm a non-tech person in this tech world. You know, I started out as a K-12 educator and I taught English and reading. And so literacy is my area. Curriculum and instruction is where my doctorate is. And so I am a non tech person in this tech world, but I also know that in order to be prepared for the future of work, the future of business, the future of learning, um, you need to figure out your positioning in this space. And so the block is all about exposing you to your options. So you can then do your own research by starting with some resources that we've provided, that we have vetted in, in some way, that way you can go down that rabbit hole that we talk about in this space in a good way, <laughs> in a good way and have a good experience. So the International Council of Registered Blockchain Professionals is the primary sponsor of the block and we appreciate you joining us today. And today we have our, our subject matter expert who's going to talk about what Doc Vince introduced the show with EVM and non-EVM chains and what does that mean and uh, Ethereum and we're going to have this conversation and it's only going to be an introduction so let's just say that it won't be everything about the topic because this this show is you know we don't want to keep you here all day and we could easily um so we're just going to give you an introduction to it but we will definitely have him back if necessary and if we come across something that we think you should know more about and that we want to share with you so it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you professor salman hater so come on in hello <laughs> hey the world Hello. So please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do in this blockchain space. Of course. Uh, so the is, uh, as I mentioned, mentioned uh, Salman Heather. And Professor is something that was added so because I have been teaching for the past one or two years in Aarhus University, which is a blockchain professional university for training the people on the blockchain platform. There are so many I have been training uh, in this industry. And I believe uh, that is where the professor word came from. I'm okay. honored to do that. I'm continuing to do so because in this industry, we do need some professionals. We need to spread information. And of course, be ready in the market to bring some revolution from Web 2 to Web 3. So my short introduction is as of now, I'm working as a chief blockchain architect, somehow as a lead uh, software architect in one of the top leading blockchain companies and I, as of now i have been working on quite some challenges in blockchain space for me uh fixing the problem is something that we need to do as a research site so yeah that's our mainly assuring production awesome thank you so much thank you for sharing that and giving us that introduction so we want to get into um so you talked about a little bit about what you're doing now in this space and how you became professor um <laughs> and i really like that and uh so thank you so much for what you're doing in in, in the place of education um in this yeah. space 
But I want you to tell us a little more about how you entered this space. How did you, not only how you became professor, but how did you become an educator? How did you really decide, I'm going to dive into this blockchain stuff, not only, and then of course, teach it. So you talked about that part, but how did you come to just even hear about blockchain and then get into it? Yeah, of course. So I had done my uh, master's in computer science from of the, one of the prestigious university in Pakistan, since I'm from Pakistan. So that university in that particular course, I was working on quantum computing. So quantum computing is more like cryptography for security, for making sure that data is not going to be hacked into any other problematic uh, bridge or stuff like this. So uh, quantum programming or quantum uh, superposition or quantum uh, software systems is something that made me feel that why not blockchain? Because blockchain itself is about cryptography. It's about safety of the data, the speed, the privacy, the transparency, incurrency, and the immutability of the data. So it was back into 2017 when I was doing my research in my master's that I came to know about blockchain and how we can solve the problems using blockchain communication and blockchain development. And then officially, I believe in 2019, I started working on it in backstage and uh, you know, trying to learn and figure out how we can come into this program, how we can fix the problems, how we can do some R&D and you know, make some research. And then officially you can say in development part, I started working and coding myself in 2020 where I started working for some organization, started development of their projects in blockchain space. And here we are today in front of you guys. So I believe uh, blockchain itself is more of an architecture perspective when you want to move yourself from a, an insecure, a centralized system to a decentralized and secure system where you can put your trust. So yeah, this is very all starter. I like how he says a few projects. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just want y'all to know that it's more than a few, just so you know. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and he actually has the tech background. I don't. So, uh, so now, so I, so, so, and I'm, I'm getting probably going to get ahead of myself because I'm so anxious. Um, to talk about this topic. And because I'm just, let's just start with the letters, Professor. <laughs> what do they stand for? What is it? <laughs> EVM, that, that's the title of, you know, uh, looking at non-EVM chains. What is EVM? Well, uh, EVM itself is a very sweet name. Uh, in, in architecture perspective, you can say EVM is a quite attractive word for engineers and architectures. And uh, we can say that uh, Ethereum virtual machine, it is uh, basically the sound and the base structure of the Ethereum blockchain or any blockchain that is working on the top of EVM4. So Ethereum virtual machine is the one which is basically running the nodes behind the scene for communicating the blockchain ecosystem or the nodes, or you can see the projects or the development or the smart contracts, the transactions, each and every single thing is running on the base, which is, of course, Ethereum virtual machine. So Ethereum virtual machine is the underlying architecture for uh, Ethereum blockchain. Yeah. You know, that, that was an aha moment for me, because now that you say that, everyone I've heard, I've heard use it has been a developer or an architect. Um, and so, and it's probably because they're coming from the back end kind of view rather than somebody who's a user. Uh, <laughs> and so maybe that's why. So that makes a lot of sense now, Ethereum yeah. virtual machine. So, you know, this, the show is really looking at EVMs versus non EVM chains. So what's the difference? And I know you kind of mentioned it already, but can we just highlight the difference between the two before we go forward? Of course, uh, before giving up the introduction for a uh, difference between these two, I would like to, you know, get back to the mother of the blockchain, which is Ethereum. Yes. Uh, before Perfect. that, we can jump on BTC, Bitcoin. But after Bitcoin, uh, we did not really have something where we can develop our own software systems. So why not we start our own blockchain, which is going to support the software development ecosystem, which is Ethereum. Once Ethereum started, there, there was going to be uh, becoming a hype the hype where the people started working 
on software development cycles and they started you know researching on their own so you know ethereum blockchain itself is quite expensive when it comes to the gas fee even if you want to transfer like five dollars you are going to have to pay ten dollars for the gas fee which is uh, more like you know a hectic problem so people started forking ethereum blockchain and they started coming up with different names such as polygon which is one of the famous uh, in the era and then they started working and it became binance and then binance smart chain so binance smart chain and a polygon chain avalanche and many other blockchains all of them are based on evm which is ethereum virtual machine so they all support the same programming language which is solidity for writing smart contracts they all follow the same wallet structure the same ideals DAOs, and every similar perspective from the architecture aspect here we are with some different solutions there were some people some different people who want to make difference so they thought uh, let's not depend on solidity let's go with some other language because solidity is more like you know uh, ecosystem constraint you are limited to a particular ecosystem and you are supposed to work around so you are more like you know limited in the virtual machine environment of ethereum and you cannot do more you cannot achieve more than that even if you fork a new blockchain that is still going to be evm and that still is going to cause some high gas and make uh, some assumptions on the base of solidity constraints on the virtual machine so they started working on some other ecosystem but still it is the fork of ethereum like solana blockchain like casper blockchain algorand is a fine example so all these blockchains are non evm compatible chains and all of them supports different languages different infrastructure different transaction mechanism and different you know the consensus protocols but still they are the blockchains they are resolving the problems so evm and non evm that's always a uh, you know war between these two okay so so interoperability is key yes that's what i'm hearing okay cuz that's I know, right okay all right so before we get to the non <laughs> And all these blockchains. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Go ahead. I didn't mean to stop you, but I just wanted to throw that word out there because I know it was on the screen. So I made a connection. Awesome. So you are still on the screen. I'm not grabbing the attention. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, interoperability. It's a fine word and uh, also really, you know, cool word to understand. But you know, this particular word is going to resolve all the problems the world are encountering. You know there are conflicts, there are problems in communication. Uh, one person understand a language, but the other don't. Let's say if uh, an English person is speaking to some Pakistani who speaks Urdu, so the English person cannot speak Urdu and the Urdu don't speak the English one. So how do they communicate? They of course need some third party evaluator or a code translator or someone who could you know compile their language into each other. That is where the interoperability came. So what we need to do, we need to remove the gaps between the two blockchain, between the two infrastructure. And by removing this particular gap, we are implementing a third party. But make sure the third party should be something decentralized. Decentralized when we say it should follow the blockchain perspective rules and all the decentralization and security and transparency perspective. So there is where we can interoperable or we can you know connect or link to different people who speaks different languages or you can say we can connect america and pakistan together so the people can communicate easily they don't really have to you know divide themselves into two different territories they are not supposed to be two different nations even though they are two different nations but still they are going to communicate with each other they are going to talk to each other like they are you know same so they, this is where we need to make sure we are building something decentralized. We are building something that is secure. And unluckily, this is where the problem occurs and we build some problems. We introduce some vulnerabilities. We introduce some hacks. Because you know, if within the ecosystem of blockchain, it is secure, it is unhackable, immutable. But once you are entering or once you are opening a gate to the blockchain, then you are introducing someone to come in and put some attacks. This is where the third party 
connections or third party bridging or layers architecture makes some problem. So yeah, interoperability, make sure you are expert and you are doing some great job in decentralizing something. Yeah. Oh, I like that. That once you open that gate, oh, you allow yes, yeah, so because security is big. So I so there's some words that I that that I just want to highlight that we've said so far and that was mentioned so far is the interoperability, but decentralization, this idea of security, and and so I'm yeah. So I'm, I'm, this is good. This is good. I'm learning. <laughs> Hello, no, no, no. did you have something to add or a question? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, yes, Dr. Tammy. So I'm really excited on uh, uh, Professor <laughs> I am too. Uh, I'm excited. I'm learning. I'm making connections. Right. So um, he's, he's discussing on interoperability and, you know, in, in Altash University, that is a course that uh, a one subject uh, session for us. So right now, is interoper issues of interoperability still a big issue? Because as you see, there are many blockchain. Altash blockchain is one as a small player, but there are big players. The mother of all in the smart contract is uh, Ethereum. And we have this Solano. We have this other uh, uh, other blockchain. So, so how would you assess the state of interoperability? Is that still something of a big hindrance? Because this blockchain still cannot communicate to one another. And after that, you answer, I will make a parallel uh, situation, comparative situation between software and social sciences. Because as we know, we people, uh, you know, you've mentioned that, you know, there are different races, different group of people, and this, it should not be segregated or it should not be too uh, comp compartmentalized, but they should interact. Mm -hmm. They should operate as one so the same thing with software and social sciences but before we drill into social sciences and software i would like you to assess what is the state of interoperability right now among blockchain is this is this still a hindrance in developing software because this operates in their own platform yeah well uh, there are two ways as you mentioned the hindrance of course there are so many conflicts everyone is winning the war everyone is trying to win their attention to make something bigger and to make something unique. So interoperability is something where some bigger junks or some giants are working on right now. And all the focus of the decentralized community is looking up to those particular networks who are trying to solve the problem of interoperability. My personal expertise, or you can say my subject matter, or the, uh, the problem where I stand, I normally solve the problems and I normally, you know, architect the situation where we can resolve the interoperability situation and we make sure that the security is something we need. We need to introduce something, you know, third party, but of course that should be something secure. So interoperability is still a question that we need to solve. And we have some bigger giants who are resolving the problem. And I believe uh, in a very few days, we can have some companies who are going to challenge and you know, uh, pretend that they have this problem solved. Okay, uh, thank thank you so much. Uh, that is. There you go. Oh no, you're on mute again. Try again. I have a follow up question and uh, interoperability. So <laughs> let's be specific right now. Um, on the assets, digital assets, have you seen? interoperability uh, being practiced in cryptocurrency you know forget about the soft uh, the, the software development so let's go back to to uh digital assets are uh, is there something um some protocol being developed um that uh, address the issue of interoperability so that people from ethereum blockchain can swap to a different digital asset have you seen that manifested in the digital asset world, in the crypto world? Yes, definitely. I did work on some of those and I did, you know, architect some of those solutions as well. So interoperability is something that I have been working for the past one year and that is quite a challenge to resolve. But yeah, we did work on some cryptocurrencies and those cryptocurrencies are interoperable between multiple blockchains. And I'm not sure if I am going to, you know, pick the names. And I, if I'm allowed to, you know, 
give their names on this platform. So yeah, there are multiple companies, multiple networks, or to home we develop subsystems where the currency or the crypto tokens are interoperable between multiple blockchains, specifically between EVM and non-EVM blockchains. Oh, so th this is this is a good this is a good news because um you know interoperability can be seen in in different digital assets. So um. How, how would you assess uh, how many percentage right now among cryptocurrency? Uh, do you think interoperabil interoperability among blockchain is operating 50%, 30%, 40%, or 100%? How would you assess that in your base, on your estimate? Yeah, well, that depends. Uh, in reality, I, I believe I could call it 30% because it's still in the progress. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many currencies, there are so many blockchains, there are so many ecosystems being introduced and, you know, giving their names as the best. So I would say 30% and uh, the rest 50% is still in the progress. But in coming weeks or in coming uh, months, we can see some live, you know, actions on interoperability. Uh, I would like to, you know, uh, section, uh, choose different stuff, uh, if you, if I may allow. Yes. Uh, I, you know, I would like to categorize the interoperability into two different ways. The first one is, of course, that digital assets that we need to, uh, you know, interoperable, that we need to separate or that we need to communicate among different ecosystems. The second is for the software itself. When it comes to digital assets, it is known as the cross-chain bridging, right? We can cross-chain bridge any token we can create a bridge between uh, two blockchains. I, mostly the solutions that we have seen, and they are quite good solution, I would say. Mostly they are on EVM chains. Like among Ethereum blockchain, Polygon blockchain, we can you know swap our tokens. We can uh, cross-chain our uh, digital assets. That's doable. But uh, with the convention or introduction of EVM to non-EVM chains, because the problem lies in the architecture. As I mentioned, I was talking to Ms. Tammy and I mentioned earlier that both different chains has completed separate architecture perspective. We cannot, you know, uh, communicate with both of the chains on the same language. Mm -hmm. So if you want to interoperate between Ethereum blockchain and let's give an example of uh, Algorand blockchain, you want to interoperate between these two. What you need to do is to write two different pieces of code. The one is going to be in, in their ecosystem, which is Python or PyTL, smart contract development on Algorand, and the second on Solidity, of course, the EVM chain. So you need to write two different set of pieces of code, two different logics, two different uh, methodologies, and you need to make sure that both blockchains are following the security standpoint. And your algorithm, your architecture is uh, security proof, right? So that is cross-chain bridging. That is doable. I personally have done some of the major projects in the ecosystem and they are live. And then there's the second problem, which is, uh, so the first one I was talking about is the digital asset communication, right? Like we need to transfer a particular token, let's say HTML coin or ABC coin or Salman coin from one blockchain to another blockchain. So that's a big milestone we have achieved so far. And that's done. We have no much no more problem on this there are so many solutions the company i'm working at as an architect is also developing quite amazing solutions the ferrum network yeah so there is the second category which i need to you know identify that is uh, why are we developing in different languages why do we need to learn so many languages from development perspective if miss tammy wants to learn some blockchain because i see she is excited so i want to train her right and I want her to learn some blockchain, but I'm gonna get started with EVM chain and then non-EVM chain. And I'm sure at the end of the day, she is going to you know, end up doing nothing. And she would say, no, 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 I'm okay with being host. I don't wanna, I don't wanna run blockchain. I will run a, whole, a channel, that's okay. So why is that problem? Because we need to learn so many languages, so many infrastructure, so many architecture, so many ecosystem. And we need to make sure that all of them are secure. All of them are decentralized. We can do that. One blockchain engineer, one blockchain architect should be working on one language, one ecosystem, right? So why, if you want to work on Solana, 
I heard they are good in NFTs, in Metaverse. So, okay, let's work on Solana because their gas fee is low, their graphic is good. But I need to learn a different language that is Rust. And you know, Rust is quite a hectic language. They have to jump deeper into the architectural layer of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So that's a tough one. You, you have to learn Anchor, you have to learn Rust, you have to learn a completely different ecosystem. And it, it is going to take at least one month if you are a good developer to learn such platform. Then after some time you decided, no man, I'm not okay with Solana. I want to learn something new because Algorand is in the market. Casper is good. There is Ferrum Network. There is, uh, you know, Polygon. There is so many other languages, for example, so many other platforms. So if I want to learn Tezos or if I want to learn Substrate, I'm going to have to learn a different language. If I'm going to have to jump into Cosmos SDK, then I'm going to have to learn Go language. Their ecosystem, their module implementation is completely different. So why are we learning so many languages? We are not building a solution. We are building ourselves into a mess, into a confusion, into a state of mind where we can't do anything, where we are jumping from one technology to another technology and we are achieving nothing. Hmm. It's more like, you know, Jack of all and master of none. I am at such situation right now because I have been working on so many blockchains. I have been working on so many languages, so you can call. So we right. are developing the solution, right? Yeah, come, come again, right. Amanda. Right, right, obviously, there are many languages, um, you know, languages used to, to create syntax. So this, this blockchain or platform has its own main language, such as Solidity for EVM. For non-EVM, you can name whatever uh, languages. So there are different languages. So in your philosophy, there is no right and wrong. In your philosophy, should we have a universal language or is it necessary to have different languages or should we just say like, you know, these are just a couple of languages that we should use so that um, we can, you know, communicate easily. Because right now, as you can see, there are many languages, but in the world of digital assets, you guys are able to do it to communicate now. But if we jump to software development further, not just digital asset, but, you know, uh, sovereign identity, pushing more on, more on uh, software development, blockchain as a, a service, not just as a, a digital asset tool. So what would you what would you choose? Should we have a limited set of language where we should use or should we just have one monolithic language or we should just let right now we have plenty of languages that is, you know, people are like crazy because if you really want to work with you know, to, to, to blockchain, you have to learn both. And that's just yeah. too much of a hassle to developers, programmers, and software architects like you. So what, what's your take on it, on this one? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, uh, we need to unify something in order to resolve this problem. There are two ways. The first way is to restrict ourselves into first language. And that language is something which everyone should understand at least. In blockchain space, Amanda, I would ask you a question. Uh, which particular language is universal in your personal information? Well, um, in, in Altash blockchain and in Ethereum, you know, solidity is highly encouraged. But as you see, there are also, uh, there are pro with solidity, but there are also cons with solidity. So um, I have no answer. Um, I'm going to give back the question to you since you are a specialist <laughs> in the field. Uh, well, sure. and, you know, yep. and I'm, I'm gonna let him answer, but I'm just listening to the conversation. And I, you know, I'm always talking about the integrity of the technology. And I think when you propose one language, right, when you propose one of anything in this space, that goes against the integrity of the technology and what this space is about. Um, and so that that bothers me just as a listener, as as someone here to learn, um, because we talk about decentralization, we talk about sovereignty, we talk about freedom. And then to say there should be one common, you know, that's that's like saying telling everybody in the world you must speak English like that's no, no bueno. <laughs> 
<laughs> not that good, right. not good. So go I ahead, agree. Professor. Go ahead, Professor. I just had to throw that in there as the layman here. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. I really understand. But I already mentioned that there are two options that I would like to propose. The first option is you can say, uh, let's you know unify one language, such as Solidity, because I believe 80% of the developers in blockchain or 80% of blockchain literates are development, their application, and Solidity. So if the 70% of the population is working already on Solidity, then why not get started on this? And the 30% of the people who wants to do something new or maybe who wants to you know, stand out, so they are working on some tougher language and of course they have some own benefits. As you mentioned on the sovereignty and the integrity, of course, we need to solve that problem as well. So the second solution is, why not we gather some of the languages that are already in the market? Let's pick Rust, let's pick Go language, go for Python and go for Solidity. Let's gather four languages that is going to help out. And also we have JavaScript, which is a universal language when it comes to integration of the blockchain system with the application, right? So either we can unify one language that is being used by so many people, or we can go about some separate standards of the languages. You know, uh, if I talk about uh, some ecosystem, let's say um, Ferrum Network, uh, we have multiple languages that is working on our mainnet. If we talk about, uh, you know, Algorand, they have separate languages that we can utilize in order to develop stuff. like. In Algorand, you can use PyTL. In Algorand, you can use TL language. You can use Rust. You can use JavaScript. You can use Go language. So they are not restricting you to utilize one language. They are allowing you to learn. If you are from a background of Rust programming, you are welcome to start working on this one. If you are from a background of JavaScript or some web browser natives, go ahead. So there is no restriction. So we are focused on developing a platform where we should focus on two solutions. As of now, first solution is to go with one language. Now, let me explain how the interoperability should work for software development, for removing the gaps, and for connecting two different worlds. I'm going to call it two different worlds because all of them pretending that they are the best. So let's connect EVM chain with non-EVM chain. And for example, as of now, we want to, uh, let's, let's name uh, EVM chains Polygon. Ethereum, Binance, right? Let's name here non-EVM chains. We have Solana, we have Algorand, we have Substrate, Cosmos. So let's have four, four lang different ecosystems. Now, my point is we need to develop something of a network or an ecosystem where we are going to allow the person to develop in one language. Let's develop the software in Ethereum. I want to develop, um, a staking contract or a simple NFT, and I want to develop it on one platform. Let's say I'm coding all of it in Solidity. Once that is developed, now I should have a deployment option. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select from the multiple blockchain names, from non-EVMs, from EVMs. I'm going to name, okay, Polygon and Avalanche and Binance. Now I have selected three blockchains where I want to deploy my Solidity smart contract. All I need to do is to just click on the deploy button and that's done. I'm going to code once and I should be able to deploy on these EVM chains. Now the question is back to non-EVM chain, how we can achieve this? Because they have different architecture. They have different languages. So how we are supposed to do it? We are going to develop the program in Solidity, for example, and then we will allow the people to go for non-EVM chain, select the non-EVM chain, Solana, Algorand, and for example, Substrate. So these three chains are selected. Just click on the deploy button and that's done. This is how we can simply you know, deploy our program that is written once, but utilized on different chains. So we can go to these chains, their explorers, we can search for our transaction, we can search for our block, and we will find our deployment links. But this cannot be done unless we, we are going to have some layer on top right. of all these blockchains. Right, so let me help uh, simplify this uh, concept uh, to our layman's speakers in the audience. 
Um, so what what you're saying is, okay, we have a standardized one, whether it is ba it is solidity or based on solidity from other and then mixed with other languages. So this one, when you deploy it, and then there are options for non EVM. So what will happen is if you click non EVM what will happen is it will be translated to their respective languages. So the syntax that you created, the instruction that you created in Solidity, that is the language you created on the syntax, you know, the instruction that, that you behave in this way, in that language, the name of that language is Solidity. And then when you deploy it, you know, when you deploy it, when you test it, then you just simply select this other languages. And now we are hopeful the ideal way your proposal is when you click other platforms speaking in different language. So it will be translated to their language, to their syntax. So that is your proposal, and which is a very noble one. I think, you know, this is how, you know, software development is not all about numbers, but there's also philosophy and uh, critical think, of course, critical thinking, but there's this philosophy where a language based in solidity, but when you deploy it, it can be translated to these other languages. I think there is a common right. ground where we can met. What do you think, Dr. Tami? Okay, okay. I like the sound of that. That sounds much better. <laughs> so yes, yes. He answered that right. and clarified because I was right. getting... <laughs> right, because, you know, if we go back to social science, if we apply the idea of social science, and Dr. Tami is an expert on this, especially in developmental uh, social science and education, uh, you know, uh, there is this school of thought that we cannot have only one dominant strain, one dominant culture, one dominant language, but we have to entertain other ones because these other ones offer... Uh, offer variety, richness, and security. Uh, because you, as we already mentioned, solidity is not the, ult the, the ultimate language out there. There are also cons. And then these other options right here, you know, they are not as famous as solidity, but they, they're also good in different parts. So the same as you translate it to the situation in society where this group of people must be given a voice because they're good at this. Or, you know, they can enrich the fabric of society. So if we entertain other platform in the blockchain space, they will help the blockchain space grow. And how are we going to do that? Uh, your proposal, interoperability through, I don't know, for lack of a better term or for my ignorance, I would use translation translating this syntax to their language. Yeah, I think of the diversity, equity, and inclusion, like in all forms and in all aspects. So, yes. yes so, oh my goodness, look at the time. We have really talked <laughs> today. So, um, so Armando, did you have another question or our final question before we we try to wrap things up because we're, we're already. I know. Moving. I'm just going to be quiet we're here. We're just getting started. <laughs> I, I'm satisfied, but I'll let you and Dr. Vicente uh, talk now. Uh, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Thank you, um, y'all. The and the reason I'm laughing is because you had to be behind the scenes before the show, um, because that's exactly I knew Amanda was excited about this topic, and I just knew he was doing the interview, and he said, "No, you are." And then look what happened, y'all. I'm just saying. <laughs> Case. <laughs> so when he says no again, he'll actually stop and think about it. Like, do I want to? So, um, so thank you. So, uh, so I guess we should kind of wrap this up and I'm going to sure. allow you to do that. Um, because I know that we've mentioned a lot and we've thrown out a lot of terms. We've talked about all these different chains, all these different languages and all of these things. And so, um, I guess what I want you to do is just kind of wrap this up and kind of bring this to kind of a closure or some way. I, I guess we'll we'll have you back because there that's that's probably not a thing at this point um, because we just opened up a whole can. We haven't even talked about um, some of the things that you know the basic things that probably we probably need to fill in some gaps. But if you could try <laughs> to fill in some of these gaps and kind of bring this in, when we're talking about. Um, chain interoperability between EVM and non-EVM chains and and all the conversations we had around language and Amando adding in the translation and all of those things. What say you? <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just going to leave it open. Just help us out. <laughs> So we don't leave here confused or lost or knowing what the next thing is. Maybe there's something that you would recommend us follow up, a resource that we follow up in, you know, after the show. Sure. All right. So let me have the crown now. So I'm going to have to talk because it's ending time. Uh, of course. So as you mentioned, let me summarize some all of stuff. The major problem, as I mentioned, every developer is facing, every person is facing being a uh, simple user. Uh, that's the fact that we are finally transforming into blockchain. That's the fact that we are finally converting ourselves into Web3 community. And we cannot undergo that. We cannot stop that. We are into this ground yeah. where we have to go for the decentralization. Yeah. We have to trust ourselves and we are going to go great, you can say. From developing a simple application to you know running some Mars operations, maybe. All of them are going to operate on blockchain. So when we have so many technologies, all of different blockchains, all of different ecosystem has something to offer. Mm -hmm. I can't say that uh, that particular blockchain is not good enough. That uh, solution is not good enough. Our hash blockchain itself has so many pros. I'm a fan of it. I personally used it and I'm a big fan. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda, for the great work here. So. <laughs> There are so many solutions we are working on. We are excited about it and we are excited to work on something which is going to be unique. Of course, the uniqueness is never found. Before Web3, uh, I'm going to quote a little example. Before Web3, we had a problem of unification of software development on mobile phone. We wanted to develop some application which is going to run and operate from one code to both ecosystem, such as on Android, on iOS, on Microsoft phones. So we have done it. We have introduced some of the languages, React Native, some other platforms, which is giving us an extension to interoperate between multiple ecosystem. The same should apply on blockchain. We are still in our runner-up runner -up stage. We are still on the beginning level. We have yet to see a lot in action. I'm not sure if we are going to see that, but yeah, that's a lot. I'm, I'm sure we are going to count on. Yeah. And just, I'm going to give you a single word. We are also looking up for quantum blockchain, which is going to be a revolution into the world. I do have my research. Maybe I'm going to talk about this another time. So if we are supposed to work on a speciality and if you want to you know, make blockchain and Web3 community more mature, we need to you know, remove the gaps between the communication on both ecosystems. And we need our both you know, EVM to non-EVM chains to interoperate, to cross chain, and to you know, interact with each other and start communicating as soon as possible. And once that is done, there is not going to be any other problem. The people are going straight up here. Why are we paying so much gas fee, so much you know, transaction fee for cross-chaining our tokens using some centralized bridges? There are so many hacks in the market. There are people who ask me, because uh, they consider me an expert and they ask me, bro, you are telling me that blockchain is special, blockchain is secure, then why are these hacks into the market? Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to tell you once again, by quoting that open gate, that when we are opening a port to the outside world from the blockchain into our smart contracts, into our applications, we are allowing third party problems to come in. So we need to make sure that whenever we are bridging from our application to the other ecosystem, we are building a decentralized and secure blockchain solution. Mm. And that's where the interoperability is going to be a successful case. And that's where we are going to, you know, make ourselves a giant, you know, humanity state blockchain running process. And I would like to, you know, shout out here on our perspective. And yeah, blockchain solutions are quite amazing. Personally, the company where I'm working at, we are building interoperability solution. Ferrum Network is building one of the best, and you can see stead out solution where we can run our projects by simply writing the code in Solidity and deploying on multiple blockchains. We can deploy it on EVM, non-EVM, we can deploy it on Substrate, we can deploy it on you know, Algorand and other blockchains. So that's more like a, uh, you know, write the code once and deploy it everywhere. So it's a multi-chain, software development kit you can see 
So that's where the problem is going to be resolved. And there are other blockchains, there are other networks who are also working on the same solution. So we are going to look up, wait a little, and I'm sure the solutions are on its way. We still have some bigger problems to solve. Interoperability is just a start. Once mm. we are going to communicate, then we need to see how we can start other stuff. Professor, you're just opening things up. So he just said, that's a start. So we haven't even gotten to the real issues that are to come. So, um, wow. So I thank you. Thank you so much. So can you share with us, um, you mentioned something that your company is working on. Um, can you talk about any, are, are there any projects or anything you're working on um, more specifically yourself um, that you want to share with us um, or anything you have upcoming? like this book that you have to write um, on, on these terms that you, you're you doing the research on. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know if that's a thing, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, our FAM network is building a multi-chain network process, a multi-chain network kit, where we can provide the developer with a software development cycle and ecosystem where he can come in. He can simply, you know, the way you want to learn blockchain, you can, you know, log into Ethereum blockchain, you can get started with the development and learn everything from scratch. The same way Ferrum Network is providing our software development ecosystem for our developer-friendly platform, where we can simply come in and start learning Solidity. Or if you are already a Solidity developer, you can start working on this project and you can start development. All you need to do is to learn a little on the concept of the architecture point of view and how Ferrum Network is working, how your code is going to be translated onto other EVM or non-EVM convertible blockchains mm -hmm. deployment model. So that's where the multi-chain ecosystem works in. And that's more like one of the biggest uh, solution that we are here to provide. Thank you. So we can, yeah, just uh, for the information, we can simply go to the application like ferrum.network. We can go to their website and you guys can also support me. So All right, that's, that's what I was going to say. Solution. I was more interested in what you were doing. <laughs> and yeah, are you uh, talking, are you having these conversations or do you have any presentations or speaking engagements coming up that you're talking about this so people can learn more? And of course, how can we follow you? How can we follow you so we can learn more? So tell us how can we connect with you as well? Yeah, of course, you guys can have my LinkedIn profile. So there you can, you know, simply go and subscribe or maybe you can... Uh, go and talk to me. I'm always available. I'm just, you know, one message away, one connect away. And uh, of course, my major task is to solve problems, is to make our community grow and to make sure that we are going to build some amazing products. Of course, not just the monkey faces. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to talk about that because I have, yeah. a, I have a whole thing. I get on the soapbox about that too. But yeah. yes, to solve problems, and make sure our community grow. I really like that. I really like that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for being here. Any final thoughts, anything that you want to share before we bring in Doc Vince and we head out of here? Yeah, well, I would like to give a shout out to all the people who are struggling to learn new things. Mm. At my point, I started with nothing. I was no one. I had no recognition in my four years of career in software development. I literally never received even one job offer. Wow. And right now I have been receiving the job offers from the biggest companies and tech giants. I have been turning down some offers from the giants as well because I'm focused on my career path, not just the career path, but I am focused on resolving the problems. Yeah. So just always heads down and start struggling yourself and make sure that you are up to the speed and the opportunity will come and knock at your door and one day you will be way better than me. But yeah, I would like to thank you, all the people who were with me and who stood besides, but there were so many people who were questioning my integrities, who questioned my you know, personality, who used to call me no one, but I'm right here and I'm talking to you people, like maybe millions of the people right now. So that's the proof that struggles never ends, but you need to think smart. You need to play smart because this is not the hardworking time right now. The world is going fast, so you need to grow fast. You need to go exponential. For that, you need to think smart and play smart. So, yeah. Oh, I love that, Professor Hayter. I love that because I'm one of those people. 
on one of those people you're talking about. So thank you um, for that encouragement to kind of stay with it and stay connected. So stay connected with him. Make sure that you're following him. Check him out on LinkedIn, follow him, connect with him and reach out if he can help you in any way. Um, I really like I really like that. Sure. You know, think smart, grow smart and of course, educate yourself. You know, we're, we're all about education here. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for um your knowledge on this topic. I mean, I was so enlightened and uh, thank you for your answers because I would depend on that one answer. I was about to tell Doc Vince to pull the plug. We're cutting the show, but I really like that answer. So I thank you so much for, um, for, for being an advocate for um, what this space is about as well. So I gathered that too, even though we didn't really talk about that, but um, just by your responses, to my concerns and the concerns that are typically um, highlighted in this space and knowing that even though you operate in a certain space, you also understand the technology, you understand what it means for those of us who are from black and brown communities and who are entering this space um, new and you know unaware. So thank you so much, Doc Vince. You have anything to say, Armando? Uh, anything to say before we go? Um, I have none. I'm oh. just so gr grateful, <laughs> grateful that um, <laughs> Professor Salman, as a subject matter expert, is uh, giving yeah. us graces for today. Yeah, I know the knowledge, encouragement. I mean, we've we've covered the whole thing, and uh, yeah, this has been great. I've enjoyed it, Doug Vince. Yep, and we covered the whole nine, nine yards of EVM, non-EVM interoperability. And for those who are watching right now, you could watch us at our Facebook page, LinkedIn page, and at the same time, YouTube channel. And I have to add this in our stream. It may sound or it may look like there's nothing in there, but actually, after this one, oops, sorry, it'll be <laughs> like this. Okay, I've been playing a lot. So anyway, it'll be like this. <laughs> it's all right. There it Go is. Go right here for the next video. And I guess the next video would be, let me see, very interesting because it's about educating thousands in Web3. Now, we do have a subject matter expert for that. And please go just right here. And again, we would like to thank you all. Bye-bye, stay safe, be safe, and God, but God bless. This blockchain continuing education Bye, program is brought to you by our major sponsors. HTML Coin, Utility Coin Beyond the Hype. Altash University, your online school in the fourth industrial revolution. Libra Codes, take control on your NFT creation. And Credence Hub, verified credentials, anytime, anywhere. We also would like to thank our partners.